This is the Hiking Through Life podcast. We've all been gifted a journey called life. Let's see where the journey leads us today. Welcome to the Hiking Through Life podcast, where we talk with people who in some way, shape, or form have been influenced by the outdoors. I'm Andy, the producer of this podcast, and my lovely wife, Sarah, will be your host. Together, we make up Hiking Through Life. This podcast is all about bringing all kinds of people who are inspired by the outdoors and sharing their stories. We hope that by sharing people's stories, it inspires others to get out and live a more meaningful life. Tune in every week for new episodes, or better yet, subscribe to the Hiking Through Life podcast on your favorite podcast provider. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others. Also, if you have a story to share or know of anyone who might be interested in being a guest on this podcast, head on over to hikingthroughlife.net slash podcast and get in touch with us. Now sit back and enjoy this week's episode. Welcome to the Hiking Through Life podcast. Today we have Clay Evans on the podcast, better known on the trail as Pony, he has quite an extensive list of through hikes. He's completed the Colorado Trail, the AT, the Foothills Trail, the Alabama Pinhoti Trail, the Great Plains Pilot Trail, and most recently was planning to through hike the PCT, but that got postponed due to the current pandemic situation our world is in. A few episodes ago, we had Strider on the podcast who spoke about the Great Plains Trail. Today, Clay is going to talk about the section of the Great Plains Trail that is considered most hikeable that he completed last year. But through hiking isn't his only passion. He's also a professional writer and editor for over 25 years, and he's also shared a handful of his through hiking stories on his website and experiences on the trek that he's written for. So welcome to the Hiking Through Life podcast. We're really excited to have you here, Pony. Thank you. Do you guys have trail names? No. no. Ooh, we okay, don't. just Sarah and Andy. Thanks for having me on. Yes, I wish we had trail names. There was a time when we tried to give them to each other, but we figured we we can't just give them to each other. They have to they have to come naturally. We are trying mm. to like force them upon each other. I'm I'm a trail name libertarian. I'm a believer that you can get your trail name any way you want, including like if you're worried about somebody, you know, calling you snot rag or whatever, you can give yourself a trail name before you go out there and plenty of people do. And, and then other people, you know, they have them given it. So where does your name come from? Pony. Yeah. My first long hike, if you don't count the one I did in the Black Hills, a 50 mile hike as a Boy Scout when I was 12, was the Colorado Trail in 2015. Um, and I think it was day three, it was very early in the hike and I was going along, you know, it's just, it, I was super excited. I'd had an incredibly exciting year, but getting outside in the wilderness was just amazing. And I, I walked past this guy, very old guy, probably seventies. And he had his camp off just off the trail. And as I walked past, he said, slow down. And I'm a person that kind of speaks my mind. I wrote editorials and opinion column for years and years and not in an aggressive way, but I just thought, well, that's a weird thing to say. So I stopped and I walked over and I said, well, what do you, what do you mean slow down? And he's like, oh, if you don't slow down, you know, kind of, you won't, you'll miss everything. And I said, you know, here's the thing, man. I don't think I've missed anything. I've already seen a moose. I've only been on this trail for three days and I'm having a great time. And I said, I don't walk fast. I just go all day. I sort of put my head down and I've got these short little stumpy legs and I just go all day. I don't really stop a lot. I don't need to smell the roses. I see the roses. I see the tadpoles. I see the moose. And that's just kind of how I am. And so he sort of rubbed his chin and he said, so you're like a little mountain pack pony, are you? And I said, yeah, pony, because not a horse, because I've like, got these like really short, stocky Scottish legs, you know. So that was it. I, I thought, you know, I'll take it. I thought that was a cool name. And I haven't ever run into another just pony. I've met a pony boy and a pony girl, but not just a pony. So like, did that 70 year old guy even realize he had just given you a trail name? He did not, but I found out later that his, well, I think I must've found out then, but his, his trail name is Slow Man. 
I don't know if he's around anymore, but this was his trip. He would go on one of these trails, you know, during season. I don't know, I, I don't know much about him, but, and just sit there. And one of his things was he really wanted to make sure everybody was really getting the best experience. So he'd just like hike five miles a day and pull off and yell at everybody who went by to slow down, pretty much. So he called himself Slow Man. Cause I had to ruminate about it, but you know, I think by the end of the day, I was like, yep, I'm gonna just introduce myself as well. And then it just stuck. So that happened in 2015. And is that when you began all your through hiking experience? Yeah, and honestly, I am still surprised that it took me so long to get there because I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, which is sort of like one of the outdoor meccas of the West. And I mean, I climbed 14ers my whole life. I actually, it's not true. I did a trek around Annapurna in Nepal in 1986. So that, I don't know how many miles that was, a couple hundred miles. But it was weird to me and that I didn't because in 2006, I had started an expanded outdoor section in the daily paper in Boulder, Colorado. And I was the editor of that. And this guy named Paul Mignanti, great guy, triple crowner. Uh, he's got a website, pmags.com one of the sort of old school triple crowners, he came to me in 2006 and he said, hey, I'm going to fast pack the Continental Divide Trail. Well, I'd not heard of the Continental Divide Trail, but he explained it to me and back then it was pre iPhone. So he proposed that he would go to town every two weeks and mail me a disc with whatever he'd written about, you know, the last couple of weeks and some photos and then we would run it in the outdoor section. So we did that for his three month, very fast, fast pack of the CDT, which he did southbound. And so I knew about it, right? I mean, you'd think like, I, it is so right up my alley, but maybe because I was working and I had a kid and all this, but then what happened was in 2014, a young woman who grew up next door to me in Niwot, Colorado, she had grown up and become a nurse and everybody was super impressed. She had this life and summer of 2014, she did up and quit her nursing job and took her dog Jude out to do the Colorado Trail. And when she came back, man, both she and Jude looked tanned, rested and ready. They were like sleek and golden. And I was like, oh man. So I hung around with her looking at her pictures and all this stuff and I got really, really intrigued. So Sparkle was her trail name. And then Jude was just Jude. And that kind of began the process. And this is the embarrassing part. Later in December, uh, I had read the book Wild. I had enjoyed it. My wife and I went and saw the movie and literally, I don't know, 10 minutes into the movie, a light bulb just went in my head. And I came out of the movie and my wife and I were walking back to the car. I said, hey, you know, and she said, don't tell me. You're gonna go do that, aren't you? And I said, no, 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 I promise. I'm just gonna do the Colorado Trail. So, so I wanted to get my, my toe in a little shorter trail and that that's literally how it started so thanks to pmag sparkle and cheryl Strait. <laughs> yeah and cheryl Strait. yep little does she know she's been an inspiration to you <laughs> i'll tell you what though i've interviewed a lot of people for trek stories and stuff you'd be surprised how many people mention her way more or the movie you know the reese weather movie way more than they do like bill bryson yeah i think the pct really got like a huge amount of fame after that movie and book came out it did it did and i have i have very little tolerance for snooty through hikers who are like yeah bill bryson and cheryl straight aren't real hikers because they didn't finish the trail and i'm like you know what they're writers and they're good writers who wrote books that were about more than just like a glorified trail journal. And it wasn't their intent. Now I will criticize Bryson because on the last page he says, we hiked the Appalachian Trail. No, Bill, you hiked 40% of the Appalachian Trail, which is awesome. Anyway, they wrote good books. Yeah, yeah, they wrote good books. They share their story and experiences. And that's kind of what it comes down to, sharing experiences on the trail. Yep. And that's kind yep. of what unites us all. Absolutely. So it kind of sounds like the outdoors has kind of always been a big part of your life. I mean, growing up in Colorado, you did all this stuff. But yeah, through hiking didn't really come until later on. So did you need to do a handful of training to do through hikes to kind of get in through hiker shape? Or did you just go out there and do it? I did not. I was 53 uh, the summer I did the CT. And I'm a runner. 
And although I don't do this stuff anymore, I, you know, I did marathons and ultra marathons. And of course in Colorado, in Boulder, you're just, you're literally smack up on the foothills. You're just, you can run straight up 3000 feet if you want. You can't really run, but you know, so I really didn't have to do any of that. I had been overseas for about a month, not too long before then at sea level. And I was like, oh gee, you know, is it going to be a problem? But I didn't specially train. And um, I was fine, except for things like chafe. You know, that was like a little bit of a new experience, but really as far as being fit, I, I was ready to roll. And did you have plans when you went to go do the Colorado Trail? Were you like, I'm going to do like this amount of miles per day? Did you have goals like that? Or were you just ready to see where it took you? Yeah, you know, I think the planning of it is fun. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm super OCD in weird little ways, but not really a big planner. But I did have fun. Somebody said, make a spreadsheet. So I made a spreadsheet. And one of the first lessons that the trail taught me and that the 80,000 word length sort of blog book that I wrote about my AT hike is called The Trail is the Teacher. Yes, I read a little bit of that one. <laughs> yeah, one of the first things was planning's fun, do as much as you want. The second you set foot on the trail, it's gonna go out the window. I mean, there's people who stretch it out to a week or two and it just, you can't. So honestly, what pleased me was that I was doing more miles than I thought I would do. And weirdly, so the CT is kind of broken in half by US 50, roughly. And the lower half of the trail is totally different. There's like so many fewer people. You're really out there. You don't see hardly anybody or I didn't. And then you go through the San Juan Mountains and it's much steeper and all this stuff. I thought, well, slow down. Actually, I, my mileage was four miles on average per day higher for the second half of the trail than it was for the first. So, and my thing is every day I do have a goal in mind, especially if I'm hiking with a family or trail family or something. I'm like, yeah, we're going to get to this shelter or whatever. But if I'm not with somebody, I have that idea in mind, but almost all, not almost always, but a, a, more often than not, I'm going to go further than that. So it's very rare that I can't make it as far unless I got sick or hurt or something. Okay. And you mentioned like trail families versus hiking alone. And from your list of through hikes you've done, it seems like most of these hikes are kind of hikes that aren't as popular. So would you say most of them were done solo? Yeah, for sure. And definitely on the CT, I met some, I definitely met some cool people and, you know, hiked a little bit with them on the first half of the trail. For sure. People you just run into. And I just thought of myself as a loner because I've always climbed mountains alone and all this. And, and I thought, well, that's fun. That's, it's kind of cool. I got that first taste of that incredible social connection that you get, that accelerated intimacy. And then in the second half of the CT, there was, a, I saw hardly any hikers, but there were two people that I leapfrogged back and forth, really almost to the end of the hike. Um, Moonshine and uh, Moonbeam, sorry, Moonbeam, and a guy that I gave him his trail foot was Bigfoot. And that was, it was really fun and I enjoyed that. And then my next trail was the AT and I thought, well, I'm just, I'm a solo hiker. I'm going out there and I'll be a solo hiker. But again, really quickly and especially on the AT, I think, that's just a huge part of the experience. And the one main trail family I had, I was 54, and these three guys were, I think, 28, 25, and 23. Two of them chased me down and, like, forced me to be in their family in, I don't know, Tennessee, North Carolina, somewhere. Because we'd seen each other, and, and, and they were just curious, like, well, how's this old guy always winding up in the same place as us? Well, they were sleeping in and taking a long lunch, and they gradually sort of figured it all out. And, uh, and they literally had a plan to chase me down and like force me to walk with them. And I have to say, the month or so I spent with a couple of those guys, and then there was a fourth guy who joined us for a while, was really the best month. And I, I had quasi trail families up north. I mean, we had to break apart because various things were happening, but wow. And I'm still really, one of my best friends is one of those young guys. I mean, hell, he's like 31 or something and I'm now going on 60. And we're actual friends, like not just like embarrassed friends. We like hang out, I go visit him, you know? So it's great. That is so amazing. Just like age and like your backgrounds and nothing, 
your history doesn't really matter when you're out on the trail. It's just like you, it's you and the trail and the people around you. And you have all the time in the world to just connect and become close friends. Yeah, it's transformative for me. Because again, I'm not an antisocial person. Obviously, I can be gregarious. I can be loquacious. I can talk. I've done public speaking. But I spend a lot of time alone. And I'm perfectly happy to walk for 12 hours in the woods by myself. But I love that, and I liken it to like a boot camp experience. You're all engaged in this pretty difficult thing. You're all pulling in the same direction. You're coming from all different backgrounds, but that's what cements you together. And out of the hundreds of people I met on the AT, I mean, I can count on one hand people that seemed a little, you know, aggressive or off to me. And it's so it's incredibly supportive. And I, I mean, I I hiked with my then. 19 year old cousin for a while. I met a couple of 30 something healthcare workers who they had hiked a long way with this 18 year old young woman. And then she got behind and then her mom called them and said, oh, I think her name was Sunshine or Sunbeam or something like, oh, Sunbeam is so sad without you. If I pick her up and bring her to you, will you hike with her? And they, they hiked the whole rest of the trail. I mean, how often would that happen, right? Yeah. How often? Would a 30-something professional couple hang with an 18-year-old for, you know, thousands of miles? It's an amazing, amazing experience. Yeah, that really is where, like, people don't really, yeah, you don't really get those experiences anywhere else. So do you have a preference whether or not you hike solo or with someone after you've done so many years of hiking? Jeez, you know, I mean, for me, the, the trail family thing... I mean, I could, I could say I had a very, very loose quasi family in the, in the latter half of the CT with um, Moonbeam and Bigfoot. But you know, we weren't like making a point of camping together or whatever. And my family, those guys that chased me down, that was organic as far as it went. I guess I would just say, I love walking alone. I'm fine with it. But whenever I get to a shelter or a campground or a hostel, um, you can probably tell. I just become a chatterbox. So I think I like a mix of it, you know? And when you have a trail family, it doesn't mean you're Velcroed together all day. It's just like, hey, uh, let's shoot for partnership shelter, all right? Yeah, okay, cool, see ya. And, you know, you might get there two hours later. I don't know. Maybe one day I'm there first. Maybe one day somebody else is there first. That kind of combo, I think I like the best. Yeah, yeah, I say you become a chatterbox. I can only imagine that, like, after hiking alone for however many hours, a lot of people, or days or weeks, so many people are just craving to be with humans and have a conversation and interact. And Andy has only done one through hike, but he did it for like 21 days on the Superior Hiking Trail. Oh, yeah. And they don't really have trail families there. Right? Well, you know, I mean, really, if you get right down to it, the AT and the PCT, yeah. CDT, yeah, you're probably going to run into some people and, you know, collect in little bunches and stuff. The, the CT, I mean, I don't, there just aren't that many trails where the whole family thing really comes to fruition, I think. It's a beautiful experience. It convinced me that I may not be quite the lone wolf that I like to pretend I am. Because really, truly, I, I mean, my heart just flutters and my tears come to my eyes when I think of that month I spent with my, my friends in Virginia. I mean, God, it was fun. You know, we had in-jokes and we had a reputation as those guys who were doing big miles and people had heard of us. And it's, it's just fantastic. It's beautiful. Yeah. And so I got to know, like your wife didn't do any of these through hikes with you. So what was her kind of perspective and thoughts on you slowly becoming a serial through hiker? Yeah, dirtbag. Well, okay. So my lovely wife hates mountains. She doesn't even like to drive into the mountains because she gets car sick. She really, truly would never, I, you know, I, she'd rather cut off a foot. She's very athletic, but the stuff she does is different. So with the CT, you know, I, it took me mm, three and a half weeks with three zero days. I'd been away longer than that. I'd been going overseas for a few years to research this book and stuff. And that wasn't a big deal. The AT, when I started, 
I had to give a speech at the World War II Museum on Memorial Day in the spring of um, 2016. And so my plan was, hey, I'm just gonna start and I'm gonna get as far as I can and I'll get off and then I'll come back. There was no way I could possibly do that. I got back and I said, listen, I'm sorry, but you really have two choices here. I can just not go back and you will hate me for the next eight, nine months, whatever, because all I'm gonna think about is the trail. I'm gonna moon around and you know, be a big bummer. Or once I've done with these obligations for about a month, I'm going back and I'm gonna finish. She was not thrilled with that for obvious reasons. She has to take care of everything, you know. But she did say, she tells her friends that that month I was home, because I was doing these obligations that I have, she said, well, it wasn't even like you were a dog. It was like you were a big pig in the house. Like you weren't offensive or anything, but you weren't really that interactive and you just weren't really present. So she agreed that by far the best thing for me to do is just go, go get it over with. And um, she doesn't love it, you know, and why would you, right? But she's very cool. And years ago we realized, hey, we encourage each other to do the things that feed us, you know? She loves dancing so much. She loves going to outdoor music and dancing and stuff. I don't really dance very much at all. So that, that was a decision we made and she's really cool about it. That's super cool that she's so supportive of it because clearly it's a huge, huge passion that you've been doing. And you guys said you had one kid? Yeah, yep, he's a grown up now. He lives up uh, near Bozeman, uh, Montana. He's a very big outdoor guy. Yeah, we did all kinds of stuff outdoors and he's amazing. His girlfriend's a horse person and they do that and he's into backcountry skiing, going to the desert. So he lives a great life up there. He's an engineer, but he trades off between like dirt bag jobs and, you know, working at summer camps or whatever and then having engineering jobs. So it just seems like a great life to me. Yeah, a little bit of everything. Yep. Cool. So let's talk about the, your whole experience on the Great Plains Trail. Um, you, so you heard our conversation with Strider. Yep. And um, you did the part that's considered most hikeable. Is that correct? Yeah. So very quickly, I think it was 2018, Backpacker Magazine did a kind of a back page feature on Steve Myers, who's this sort of Don Quixote guy who has been tilting at this really remarkable windmill of, I want to start this trail on the Great Plains. Um, and they did a story, I happened to read it. He happened to live just up the street from me uh, in Longmont, Colorado. And I just, I got, a, I got in touch by email or something. And I said, hey, I'm really interested because growing up in Colorado and the people who moved there, it's like mountains, 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 mountains. I love the mountains too. But at a certain point years ago, I mean, even as a kid, we used to go out to Lake McConaughey in the Panhandle in Nebraska. I turned east and I said, I wonder what's out there. And so I started exploring it. It's incredible. People who don't know it think, oh, corn and wheat, it's boring. No, 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 no. So I got involved just on a very low level with Steve and said that, you know, I'd help with PR and things like that. And, and then in um, the fall of 2018, he said that the board, he'd put together a little board, what they were trying to do is kind of trying to promote this at that time was 250 miles. It ended up being about 350 miles pilot trail to try to get some people to hike it, to see how doable it was. You can bike the whole thing, but as Strider said, it's a route, it's not a trail. And I became interested in that. So I was gonna hike it in the spring of 2019. There were terrible flooding and all this stuff in Nebraska. So I put it off. And then Steve got um, some interest from Omaha Public Radio and possibly doing a story. So we timed the hike for that, which unfortunately, or fortunately, however you look at it, meant that I was going out there in the very, very hottest time of the year, late August, early September. So I was super excited. Uh, I live part of the year in South Carolina, and then I spend part of the year in Colorado helping with my mom, who is an older person living in Boulder. And... Um, I couldn't do much that summer, so I was really excited. So I rented a car, drove up to Rapid City, then took a shuttle to Bear Butte, which is this incredible, it's like the Katahdin of the Centennial Trail, which is the first 125 miles of the pilot trail going southbound. It's this solitary mountain, sticks out there by itself. It's gorgeous, it's not, it's not as tall as Katahdin, but you get up, you've got 360 views, it's incredible. So I got dropped off, I hiked that, 
the evening I got there and then I started south. And like I say, the first 125 miles roughly are on the Centennial Trail, which goes through the Black Hills of South Dakota. And was this decision to go south just because it was more convenient based on Colorado? You know, I don't even remember why I decided to go south Mount. And the, the one guidebook that exists for the Centennial Trail is, a, is written in a northbound perspective. And I did run into a few little complications. I felt, maybe I was just an idiot, but I felt like signage would have been way more apparent to northbounders than southbounders. So I got turned around, N nothing terrible, but just a little. So um, I don't remember why I did it, but that's what I did. After the Black Hills, you go a little bit west on dirt roads and highways mostly. And then you head south on a, a rails to trails to Edgemont, South Dakota, and then cross what I ended up calling the Great Nebraska Savannah. This incredible expanse in the Ogallala National Grasslands of just open country. And then the last bit of it, I was with this reporter from Omaha Public Radio and a guy who was doing some recording. Uh, so I did, you know, I, I designed a little route for three days that worked too arduous for her. And you end up going back into what's called the Pine Ridge. And then the latter part of it, honestly is the least hikeable part because there are some massive roadwalks to get to Scotts Bluff, Nebraska on Scotts Bluff National Monument. And that was sort of, so Bear Butte to Scotts Bluff National Monument. And I did skip some of the roadwalks. It just didn't seem necessary in 98 degree heat, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that sounds pretty awful, 98 degree heat, holy moly. So, I mean, this is the Midwest. So as far as like the terrain of it, there isn't a whole lot of like up and down. Is that correct? No, the first part, 125 miles on the um, on the Centennial Trail. I can't remember now the total elevation gain, but it actually comes out average, just about the same as the Colorado Trail. You know, I, over the mileage, so you're going up and down, but it's almost all graded for stock. There's very few places that felt really steep and those were really short, like maybe a handful, hardly anything. Like you don't even think about it. So, and you are in the hills, you're in basically a kind of a Rocky Mountain foothill environment. That little formation actually was formed at the same time that this current iteration of the Rockies was formed. So it's Ponderosa pine forest. It can be dry. It was a very rainy year last year. And while I didn't get rained on a lot, there was lots of water which was fantastic. It's beautiful. I mean, you go by lakes. If the, if it's the water year is good, you're, you're fording streams. Absolutely beautiful. And the very last part of the Centennial Trail portion of it is in Custer State Park and um, Wind Cave National Park. And the very coolest thing there are huge herds of bison that you will see if you go through there. And it opens up much more into kind of a, you know, a, prairie high plains environment for the last mm, oh I don't know 40 miles or something like that so it's fantastic once you get to hot springs and you head west and then start south into Nebraska yeah it's it's largely open country you're not going to find shade I mean you have to struggle to find shade and there were some long hot straight roadwalks. And you know how that mental thing is so important. I'll tell you, looking at a straight road that you know, you're not sure, you know, you think it goes just 12 miles, pretty much straight, and you don't see any trucks or cars or people. How about water in those situations? Did you nope. know? Nope. Now, I, I, I packed water and it was a little desperate, but I realized that if I really gotten in trouble, I could have trespassed into some stock tanks and stuff like that. Um, once I got into Nebraska, Steve and Luke um, Strider had been up north of the Black Hills scouting some route for the, for the GPT. And they just happened to be in, in the area. I actually met them in the Black Hills. And then Steve stashed water for me across the, what I call the Savannah. And I was grateful for that. Now, it's much easier in that area because... There aren't fences and there are stock tanks and things like that. But I, I tell you, the end of one day, I just can't believe how hot and I'm so stupid. I didn't put any sunscreen on. 
I burned myself so badly. And it really was like, it sounds terrible, but it was like this incredible experience. And when I got to the end of where I was going, this tiny little hillock, like, how would you even know? And there was jugs of water on top. I was like, oh yeah, Steve, thank you. Two gallons of water. I was rich, rich, rich. I was so happy. The stuff that makes you happy on a through hike is very small compared to what we need in real life to make us happy. Right. And I mean, those drugs of water were like your trail magic because I mean, I remember reading a little bit on your stories about the experience that there wasn't a whole lot of trail magic. There was someone who gave you a small bag of goldfish, I think. Yeah. Um, but the water, I mean, I can only imagine how amazing that was to see and to quench your thirst after that. I mean, it, the way you describe it, it just sounds like you were hiking through a desert and you're in Nebraska. It's, it is a desert. I mean, it's definitely a semi-arid environment. You know, it's grasslands, but dang, is it hot. I mean, at that time of year. So I guess I wouldn't say, unless you really want the extreme experience, if you were going to do this, and it is doable, there's no question. Um, you know, you might not go in late August and early September, but the thing is, it's not a novice hike. The Centennial Trail, totally. Anybody, that'd be a great first trail for somebody. Once you leave hot springs, the distance between public lands where you know you can camp and the, between water and stuff, it's pretty significant. So you need to be prepared to be doing really at least 25 and often more miles a day. And it's just, it's such a cool experience. I saw not one backpack the whole trail from Bear Butte all the way down until I met the, the radio reporter, Emily, who joined me and, you know, she was, she was a backpacker. Other than that, I saw nobody. Right. And that's exactly the way Strider was describing it. It's just like, you have to know what you're getting yourself into because it's not necessarily just like a AT or PCT. No. And, and he's right. I mean, I can't remember. I think he used this word in, in your discussion, but you know, if you're a person who wants some solitude or, you know, you have a really good friend or your partner or whatever, and you just want it to be the two of you, it's great. And I would highly recommend I mean, I can recommend the Centennial Trail, which is contiguous with the Great Plains Trail for those miles, to anybody. I think it would be a great starter trail, truly great starter trail for somebody if they want a taste of what Western, you know, long distance hiking is like. And then if you want a bigger challenge, go on south from there. It's, uh, you know, had I done the crazy road walk slash dirt road walk, you know, I'd have had 40 mile days of that. And I decided to skip a couple of those days. So when you say skip those, do you mean like somebody picked you up? Well, because Emily and Josh were with me, they had a car. They were only coming out for three days to do these radio stories. So I had a choice to make. And our last day, um, Emily did great. I mean, she, it was amazing. It was hot and all this stuff. But you know, it was incredibly windy and dusty. And we were on these dirt roads. And she decided to kind of, you know, we wouldn't finish what we had thought we would do. So Josh came and picked us up. And I just had a decision to make. Well, you know, am I going to yellow blaze some of this? Or am I going to just be a hardcore and grip my teeth and walk to Alliance and all this? And I said, you know, I don't need to do that. I'm going to get about 300 miles out of it. So we went to a reservoir to swim in this crazy, like, 25-mile-an-hour wind, which was fun. And then they took me to another reservoir near Scott's Bluff, where I just skipped out on two big roadblocks slash dirt road walk. And so you would need to be supported or you, there is a shuttle up there and you know, there are people you could probably get a ride from. Or you could just do the walking. It's not going to kill you. It's just long miles and not super interesting. That's what I would say. Yeah. No, no scenery to be looking at or. Mm -mm. Whereas, you know, the Savannah part is very challenging. You need to be prepared to do miles. But I just, I was blown away. I mean, I just, my imagination was lit on fire by that. I mean, antelopes and horses and cattle, they don't see humans walking. And so I used to be a cowboy and, you know, you'd come up on an antelope and they'd see you and they're like, bam, they're over the next hill. The antelope would like run a little way and they'd stop and look at me. Same with the horses and cattle because nobody walks out there. So I, I did run into a hunter who was walking, but... It is spectacular. And I'll tell you, even if you just want like a four day adventure to start in Edgemont, South Dakota and go to Crawford, Nebraska and follow the Great Plains Trail, it'll blow your mind. And part of it's Badlands. And I mean, it is just unbelievable. 
incredible beautiful yeah and when you mentioned badlands and like how you went part of it starts in like custer state park like with that area is just incredible as well mm -hmm. yeah and i had a couple of close encounters with bison which was to me great you know i mean so that's a real plus too in that part of the trail i think it's it's great i highly recommend it and if people don't think they're ready for something hardcore go do the centennial trail it's perfect if you want to do that and then top it off with kind of a real adventure do 250 miles to crawford nebraska so when you say 250 miles how how long were you out there doing this yeah, and I went beyond Crawford. So um, I uh, I guess it was about three and a half weeks. Is that right? That's, I guess it was more like two and a half weeks is what it was. That's what it was. It wouldn't be three and a half. Um, and some of those days, three of those days were sh much shorter miles because I was walking with Emily, the reporter. And then just because I got, as usual, to, to where I was going to meet them, I always like to be there early rather than late. So I had a couple of zero days at Crawford, which I desperately needed after the, the Savannah hike. So yeah, about two and a half weeks, but you know, you could, you could do what I did. I mean, it just depends. You have to do big miles for part of this. You have no choice. Really cool though. Yeah. And like, when you say you have no choice, do you just kind of mean like there would be zero place to set up your tent or your hammock along the road, essentially? <laughs> Yeah, so the Ogallala National Grasslands, once you hit Nebraska, um, south of Edgemont, South Dakota, and south of Edgemont was that crazy roadwalk I was referring to earlier. That day was unbelievable. But once you get in the Ogallala National Grasslands, it is publicly managed, but it's like sort of hectare by hectare or section by section. It can be privately owned or publicly. And you just, if you don't have a real granular map, you know exactly, you know, technically you might be trespassing. There aren't really fences. You know, so that's not really the problem, but you just don't want to trespass unnecessarily. So Steve, in all his hard work plotting this out, has identified very specific public places where you can camp. I'm actually tempted to get like a Forest Service map and try to really plot out exactly what little quadrants are to maybe make it a little bit easier. But I don't know, you know, it's it's pretty flat. There's some rolling hills, but you, you can do big miles there if you need to and like as you're saying like there's parts of it that are going through like private land like do you think some people might accidentally walk through private land and not really know it no because the route is on dirt roads or trails yeah i mean it's, that's basically what it is where trails are available and i think um we're going to add a part that Emily and I did on a dirt road. We're actually going to, I think, if I understood Steve correctly, we're going to reroute through a, a Fish and Wildlife Service uh, wildlife preserve, which is great. So this is what he's doing. This is what Luke's doing when they go out and scout. They're like, we have the basic route. Where can we take this where, you know, you're, you're definitely on public land? And they were saying that up in North Dakota, you guys are from Minnesota. You probably make no deck jokes, you know, but North Dakota is beautiful. You know, I know people in Colorado are like, ah, I would never go there. But I think they told me that almost the whole route across North Dakota is public land at this point. So it is coming together. And, and you know, Steve asked me to join the board and I did because I just wanted to see how this happens, if it happens. I don't think it's a guarantee that it'll become the next National Scenic Trail, but you know, it could well. And I love the respect being paid to the Great Plains. I really do. Well, yeah, and people like you and Strider are giving it so much more publicity than it would be getting otherwise, I think. Yeah, and, it, you know, it's always in flux. So the route that Strider walked, comparing what I did to he did, was different. It was routed a different way, which would really work. There's a little, I think it's a state monument called Agate Fossil Beds. And Steve has worked really hard to try to get permission to be like, hey, can we just have, it's public land, can we get people allowed to throw up a tent? And, you know, we haven't worked that out yet, but I think if we ever do work that out, that'll make that whole thing more doable and you'll have less of that kind of the big road walking that goes kind of a little bit to the southeast of there. So those guys are working hard and it's great to have Strider talking about it. His hiking resume, as you know, is just so unusual. It's just great. Yeah. Yeah. Both of you, I think it's pretty incredible, the experiences you've had. Um, so let's talk about, like, you've done a handful of through hikes. Is there any gear 
that you've decided to ditch over the years or gear that you've added? So I write for the Trek, which is great. It, I'm a journalist. It gives me an outlet and, you know, and all this stuff. And, you know, they're not like some high paying, it's not outside magazine or something like that. But one of the perks is, you know, if you're a writer, you can get to do gear reviews. So I've gotten some cool gear that I've gotten a review, which is awesome. And I love it. But I'll tell you what. All the same major stuff that I started with on the CT, I could still be using today. And indeed, some of it I do. So I stole my mom's trekking poles. I love them. They are lucky. They're like, they're like lucky for ladies, or I don't know what they, something, you know, it's got this swirly design. I love them so much. Oh my God. I got an REI Quarter Dome One tent, which I still love. Now I got a tent that I think is really awesome that I reviewed, which I also used. My um, ULA backpack, I love to death. I did get a backpack to review, so I sometimes use that. All the major stuff, my REI Igneo sleeping bag, love it. The one thing I switched out for my CT days is um, a friend of mine gave me a climate blow up sleeping pad and nothing against you climate. I just hate blow up sleeping pads. I don't want to blow them up. I don't want to have to take them down. And it had a weird surface that kind of collected water and dirt and stuff. And I was like, so when I got to Brackenridge, I had a Z-Lite pad, um, you know, just a little foam pad back at home, but I bought another one and ditched the climate. And so I, I am a confirmed Z-Lite user. I know not everybody is or can be. I sleep on it on the floor at home. So I love it. And so really, the major stuff, I haven't switched out. I've got my same little uh, Snow Peak stove. I've got my same little titanium pot, my same spork. Shoes is a thing. I used to wear hokas. And those hokas that I wore, were they were bomb proof. God, I, I could put eight, 900 miles on them. They were amazing. My feet got too wide on the AT. And after 850 miles, 860 miles on the AT, they were killing me. So I only wear ultras now. And that took care of that problem. But I would say, honestly, that's the only major thing I've switched out. I, I really love the stuff that I've got. It's kind of refreshing to hear because like there's new gear that's coming out every single day and you're always reading these things like this is the latest and greatest gear and here's why and you need to update your stuff. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not, I'm definitely not ultralight. I wouldn't consider myself even lightweight, but my base weight, you know, depending on season is 16 to 18 pounds, which I, I, I feel like is... Good, and I have some luxuries. I will not go out there without a book. And so I've learned to bring a Kindle. Um, yeah, I could do it on a phone. I did just get a new phone, which means the battery lasts. So maybe I'll just read on a phone from now on. But I bring a journal because I have to take notes. I, you know, there's little things. I, I bring a, you know, a, a charger for my phone. So there's things that I could trim out and lose two, three pounds, whatever, but, I'm pretty happy with my kit, as the British say, and um, the stuff I bought is great. Now, I'm very lucky that I've gotten to review some really great stuff that I've gotten to use, and I enjoy it, and it's helped me, you know, lower my weight a little bit if I want to do that, but I don't have to. I could still be using all that same stuff, so seriously, kudos to z -Lite, kudos to REI, and kudos to ULA PAX. I mean, those things are still going strong. Awesome. And when you say you bring your Kindle and like your book and your writing, I mean, writing's been a thing that you've done. That's your career. Was writing about your hikes something that you wanted to do as like your job a little bit? Or is that just like kind of a hobby that you were doing along the way on your hikes? In all honesty, it's a treatment for post-trail depression. That is what it's about. Now, I always take notes when I travel. I've always had a little notebook because if I don't do that, I might not remember, you know? I mean, I, and I want to remember. Sure, pictures, but so um, literally that's what it was all about. I mean, I was just in mourning when I got off the CT. I was like, oh my God, this is the life. I can't believe this is how I need to live, you know? I have a beard and not shower for days on end. I love it. Walk all the time. So it really was that. And, you know, I put them on my website. I think I'm going to turn the AT one into an ebook. Listen, we don't need another AT through hike book out there. And there's some really boring ones that are just glorified trail journals. 
I, I'd like to think mine's a step above that, but it's not going to be Bill Bryson or Cheryl Strayed. But hey, why not? I wrote the thing. It's not that hard to create and market an ebook. You know, it'll just be there if somebody wants to buy it. So I don't try to make money on it. I wrote up the whole Great Plains Trail thing in considerable detail, in part to help the board and just to have that we can refer to. You know, if somebody says, hey, I'm interested in doing this. Well, here's a really detailed description. You know, you can go there and you can look at what this guy did. Sure, because if I'm remembering correctly, Strider said there's not an official guide out yet. No, so they worked really hard to put together a data book for the pilot trail. And so it's just a Word document, literally. And I had that with me. Um, and Steve had done it, both Novo and Sobo, for bikes or walking. And so, you know, I just brought the, the Sobo walking data book. And part of what I was doing was, yes, I was trying to help publicize, you know, doing the public radio thing. But part of it also was Strider, the route was different. So nobody done what I was exactly doing. So I wanted to do it for the board and clarify and refine some of the directions and things for the data book. So I actually rewrote the data book when I got back for the Sobo. And then um, I think Steve was going to re, it's harder to do than you think, but to kind of flip that for the Novo data book. But if you go to greatplainstrail.org, uh, you can request a copy of that and you can just get it. But it's not published. You can't get it on Amazon. But there is plans for it to eventually get published or no? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think when we get it refined enough, you know, any trail could have this. When I did the Foothills Trail in South Carolina, it's a 77 mile trail. And you think, well, who needs a guidebook for that? But there's a really nice little pocket sized guidebook that you can get online. The Centennial Trail has this guidebook. And I think any trail, it's helpful for people who want to go out if there's something like that that they can have as one of their references. You should always be able to use a map. You should always bring a compass. You know, you need to know some of that basic stuff. Maybe not on the AT because, you know, there's going to be blazes. People, I don't know how, but some people get lost and even die out there. But it's very difficult to get lost. You will get off track on the AT. You will. You're not paying attention, you're whistling along or talking to your buds. And I, I think like a day three after those guys caught up with me, I led them like a mile astray. And I was like, oh God, they're going to ditch me. You know, it's, you're grumpy. You don't want to go extra miles, but. Yeah, that's the point when you just sit down on the trail and fall asleep on the trail with your pack as your pillow. <laughs> yeah. And I know Strider's working on a book book, you know, like his. Um, uh, threw him back again. Threw him back again. Right. Um, for the Great Plains Trail. And, you know, that'll be great to have because it will detail a much broader experience than I did. I mean, I did, whatever, 300 miles of it. He did all 2,200, I think. Yeah. It's a neat route. I mean, it's really cool. And I hope, and I know if Steve has anything to do with it, it will become a real trail. And do we know how many people have hiked this now? I mean, it's only like is it just you two or? Yeah, we're quite certain Luke is the only one. Strider's the only one who's actually hiked to end to end. We know that. Uh, we're pretty sure I'm the only person that's done the pilot trail. And he would have done a version of that, but the route was different at the time. And of course, I did skip some of the road walking there. So we don't think anybody else has. Now we've gotten inquiries. And I did a little uh, trail profile for the trek on the Centennial Trail. And... I've had a number of people email me. I think it will start to become more of a thing. And uh, I don't know. I hope, I mean, Steve seemed pretty happy. I hope, I hope the board wasn't bummed about my candor in, you know, my account of my pilot trail. I, I'm just going to tell the truth. And it was tough sometimes. It was tough. But tough is good. Tough is better when you have a family or people that you can, like, sit around the campfire with and, like, oh! Oh, can you believe that rainstorm? Which I didn't get. I didn't get. But hey, go with some friends. I, I would love to see like a group of four or five people or whatever do the whole pilot trail. So I hope that happens soon. Maybe you guys, you should do it as a couple. Go do it. Maybe we should. Um, <clears throat> it's It sounds a little extremely remote for me. Um, and you would love it, I know. It's remote, but you know, you're going through towns every few days. So it's just in between the towns. It's remote, but 
it's remote and it feels more remote because like on the AT or the CT, whatever, you're in the trees and the mountains and stuff. This is, you're just way out there, you know, for the plains part of it. Like, geez. But literally, I hiked from Edgemont to Crawford, Nebraska, both two little towns, but you can resupply there and there's campground and stuff. It was three days, you know, from uh, Hot Springs to Edgemont was two days. Uh, from Hot Springs back up, you know, you can go to Mount Rushmore Park. There's little towns in the Black Hills. So really, it's not crazy if you, if you define it that way. There's places to resupply, places to stop and get a hamburger if that's what you want, get a beer. In fact, on a kind of an AT, you can get off the AT most places every couple, three days if you want to. Whereas the PCT and the CDT are much, much longer. So in that sense, I think it's very doable. Yeah, when you're saying there, I guess I didn't realize that you could like resupply every two days on this trail. Is that how often you were resupplying? Yeah, I mean, it's more, more like I would say three, but yeah, I mean, I just, I was resupplying when I could resupply. That's what I was doing. Uh, I did send myself a box to a campground in the Black Hills. I'm not a big box person, but I just, I don't even remember why I did it, but I did it. Yeah, you leave Bear Butte and, you know, within a few days, couple, three days, you come to this little bitty town that's got a couple convenience stores and it's got a guest ranch with a restaurant, you know, and then I think a day after that, you can hike a mile off the route and um, there's, you know, a great burger place. Yeah, it's just, it's not, it's not as crazy remote as you think. And, um, and then, like I say, once you get to Hot Springs, Hot Springs is a great hiker town, I think. I mean, the stuff you can do there, they have a natural hot springs fed pool. It's got everything you want. It's a great through hiker town, I think. Maybe I'm being convinced here. Maybe I just think it's remote because like so few people have done it. Yeah. And again, the trick is you're going to have to walk long miles because just it's just long distances between where you know you can pitch your tent. Um, there are other places that I know from looking at maps that you could pitch your tent. So if you guys decide to do it, talk to me and I will point you to some weird little squares of public land where, you know, you could, you could throw up a tent if you wanted to. Like on the Mickelson Trail from, you know, the highway down to Edgemont or whatever, everybody says, oh, it's all private. Well, there's a few little squares of public land where you could, you know, go. So it's neat. It's not easy, but it is very rewarding and so unusual. I just feel so fortunate that I got to do this cool thing. Nobody gets to do stuff like this. Yeah, I mean, and when you say like, there's like these very few squares where there's public land where you can pitch your tent, like that's just where you like really have to do your homework and research and yep. know all those secret spots along the way. Yep, you, you're gonna have to have maps and, and you know, maybe even a GPS. Divide, you know, you need to be very specific. Now, here's the truth. All the way across the grasslands, nobody was going to bother me if I'd have gone over and swum in a stock tank. Nobody, you know, there's cowboys around. I saw a few trucks, you know, whatever. Nobody's going to say anything because, yeah, I'm sure it was private land, but, and I'm not encouraging anybody to trespass. It's not like, you know, everything's fenced off like it is in Texas. It's just not. Texas, man, whew, they, they went a different direction. It's very, it's different. There's hardly any public land there. And there are fences everywhere. Like it's hard to even run in Texas, you know? That's crazy. We did a podcast a few weeks back with someone who lives in Sweden. And people there are allowed to go on private land. They encourage everybody to use private land. Well, same with Scotland and England. I can't, now I'm going to forget the term. But there's some law they have where yeah, they can't stop you from, you know, if you're trying to cross Scotland from throwing up a tent, you know, you, you can't vandalize or, you know, you can't leave a fire ring or whatever. But so it's quite different. And Texas is the absolute antithesis of that. And their fences come right up to the road. So even as a runner, like I was in the, the hills, um, hill country north of San Antonio a couple summers ago, like it's dangerous because there's nowhere to even run. It's crazy. Very sad. Yeah, yeah. Makes you extra thankful for the public land that we do have here in the Midwest. Absolutely. And we, we need to protect it too. Jeez. Oof. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So you grew up in Colorado, but where, where do you live now? So I live half the year 
in Boulder where my mom is and my sister and I just help with my mom. She's older and my sister does it kind of half a year. She lives there. And then I do it the other half of the year. And then I live on Hilton Head Island, South Carolina for the rest of the year in, I know it sounds crazy, but in a downsizing, which it literally was, we simplified our life and we were able to come here just because circumstances, things that happened. But we really came here because I hate winter. I mean, I can deal with it, but if you're a runner and you go out every, every single morning, you, it's worse for you guys, but every morning from November at least through April, probably May, it's just going to be cold and it's going to be icy. Now, it's very different from you because in Colorado, it's sunny a lot, but it's still really, really cold, you know, so I, we just got tired of it. So now we have this in the winter, which is spectacular. I miss hills. There's not anything remotely like a hill for a hundred miles or more from where I am. And I miss trails. There's some here, but the beach is great. I've become obsessed with finding shark's teeth. So it's, it's a pretty great life, but trust me. I mean, everybody says, Ooh, we're, we're not rich, but we're not rich. I mean, we are not people who are like, well, we go to our summer home. No, we live in my mom's basement. You know, we're in Colorado and then we have our house here. The best of both worlds. Yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. And Colorado's spectacular in the summer. It's such a great place to be in the summer. But it's got to get so hot in South Carolina. I mean. Well, I'll tell you, that's one reason I go back west. So when I hiked the AT, it was our first year down here. I got a little taste of it because I was here for part of June when I took that break. But then on the AT in the mid-Atlantic states in July and August and stuff, it just insane. I used to think coming from the dry west, like, hey, I like humidity, it's great. No, I don't. I really, really don't like extreme humidity and heat. It is brutal on the AT. I mean, I, you're never dry. You know, if you're not getting rained on, you are, or me, I'm a sweater. Just, it's like I got dunked in gasoline. My skin is slick all the time. And then I got Lyme disease and it, you know, I, I make it sound terrible. I love my through hike, but it was brutal. So I really, after that, I said, I can't do the extreme heat and humidity because I need to be outside a lot. And it's just, it's just too tough. What's it like in Minnesota in the summer? I was in Boundary Waters once in August and it was fantastic. But other than that. Yeah, I think July is like by far the hottest season here in the summer. June's usually pretty decent, like you get a nice breeze at night still, but July can get really, really nasty and really buggy. Oh, everybody said, Bounty Waters, you're good. The, the, the skeeters are as big as eagles, they're going to attack. I didn't see one mosquito. A, a friend of mine from Rochester and I canoed in at Sawbill Lake, I think, and we did a week. Oh, what a spectacular place that is. My God, what a great place. I couldn't believe how fantastic it was. The water was deep and warm, no mosquitoes. And we saw the Aurora Borealis. I mean, what a spectacular place. If I could go there, I mean, I guess the bugs are usually worse, but I had no bugs at all. So it was great. Yeah. And like, if, if you're on the lake, like, enough, like it's the wind picks up too. So like sometimes the bugs are awful, but yeah, I mean, that is one thing people definitely despise about the Boundary Waters and just camping in general here in Minnesota is the mosquitoes. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess I'm not, you know, apparently some people are more susceptible to mosquitoes than others. Mosquitoes don't seem to really like me that much or bugs just in general. Cause yeah, you know, I got bugged by the little gnats and stuff on the AT. I had a head net and I got stung by so many hornets. That was bad. But otherwise like the so-called black flies up in Maine and whatever, I never, I didn't have any problems. So I don't know if it's just me or I just lucked out in the years that I went. It's your blood type. They don't like it. <laughs> so is there anything we didn't touch on about the Great Plains Trail or through hiking in general that you think is beneficial for people to hear? Um, I just think that, I think if you're a person who thinks you might like long distance hiking, I think you'll know pretty quickly whether you do or not. So I think that if you're curious about it, I highly, highly, highly urge you to just go give it a try. You don't have to do the PCT right out of the gate. Many people do. You don't have to do that. I, I again, for as a beginner hike, I think the Centennial Trail is spectacular. And as a, as a mid-range hike, 
I don't think you could beat the Colorado Trail, which despite the elevation and stuff, mile for mile physically is way, just indescribably easier than the AT. Indescribably easier. The AT physically is just a butt kicker every day. Now there's a few days, you know, here and there where things are pretty flat, but you'll know, you'll know if you like it. And here's what I also would say is, I've met overweight people who decided to go out and do it. I've met guys in their 70s, women in their 70s. I've met people with just different health challenges. I truly believe, you know, unless you have a very severe mobility issue, I think anybody can do this if you really want to. And um, you're going to know if you like it or not probably pretty quick. That's why, you know, I don't know, nobody has real statistics, but everybody says, you know, a quarter of people bail out at, at Neil Gap on the AT, which is 33 miles into your hike, because you you just know it's either for you or, or not. I, I do have a funny story there. So this is something my cousin, uh, Margarita is her trail name, heard we were hiking on the AT in that first part. And um, we stayed at this shelter, and there were all these guys that I called the midlife crisis guys. So there's like a big row of big bellied, hairy guys lying down. Yeah, they're in their 50s, 60s, 40s, maybe, probably in their 60s. Man, they all snored. It was insane. <sighs> like a diesel truck going by. The midlife crisis guys. I love yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And well, they were like little, there were the party kids and midlife crisis guys. So you're talking at the table, and this one guy who had a bright yellow jacket. You know, I didn't, wasn't talking to somebody. Said, well, what are you doing out here? He's like, well, I live out here on 18 now. What do you mean? He said, well, my wife just kicked me out. So this is where I live. I live on 18, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, cool. So the next day I had, a, I wake up really early. So I headed out and Margarita was behind me and she came up <laughs> at the end of the day and she said, Hey, remember that guy who was saying, I live on AT now. He had a big pack, right? She said, I saw him at Cooper Gap and he was on his cell phone saying, Honey, I swear it'll be different this time. And that's just the way it is. Like a lot of people you're going to figure out, not for me. I mean, that's like 15 miles into the hike and that happens. But if it is for you, then you're really doomed because whenever you're not out there doing it, it's hard. You know, living in the synthetic world as Dixie, I don't know if you know who Dixie is. She's got a great YouTube channel, very famous. Yeah. She calls this the syn synthetic world that we're in. And then the hiking world is the real reality. And I tend to agree. Yeah. Go out, go out and do it. It's, it's such a great world and you'll meet the best people and support it. It's like everything about it is what is difficult about most of our modern lives. It's simple. You walk, you make camp, you get water, you eat, nature calls. Those are the things you have to do on any given day. That's it. Nothing else. It's very simple. You're walking, you're getting healthy, you're getting stronger every single day. People start with three miles a day and they end up, you know, in Virginia blasting out 20s, you know, whatever. Um, and then there's just that instant camaraderie, the boot camp camaraderie, that just, if I don't know, I guess I'm a romantic, but it just swells my heart. It's amazing that, that feeling of how close you can get to somebody so, so fast. And not in a creepy way. It's just you, just, you just love it. You love it. So it's, the rewards are incredible, really. Yeah. And like, when you say it, it's like, it's what you do in life. Like, that's just so true. There, it's like these basic things you're doing out on the trail, but when you're doing them out on the trail, so much of that is going to be applicable to your life off the trail too. It just strips it down to its essence, to its, its bare essence. And you will, if you do this and you like it, whatever age you are, whatever background you come from, you will prove yourself to yourself in a way that's incredibly gratifying. It's just amazing. Like, I, you know, I finished the Colorado Trail and I'd just done a lot faster than I thought. Not that fast it matters, but I just felt strong and good. I just couldn't believe it when I got to the end, what an accomplishment I felt. So it's a, it's a, um, I don't want to say a cure, but it's certainly a therapy for many modern ills, in my opinion. Yeah. 
I'm reading a quote that you wrote on your um, your trail journal online. It says something. Um, there's no trail angels, no trail families, and no hostels. It's a lonely pilgrimage, yet the epitome of adventure. Ah, that, I guess I was talking about the, the Great Plains Trail. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. If you like adventure, Andy, I, don't, I presume you can hear me. You are thinking about a through hike. What, what do you want to do? Yeah, I've actually already done a through hike on the Superior Hiking right. Trail in Minnesota here. And um, somebody actually brought up the Colorado Trail to me, which I hadn't heard of at the time while I was on the trail. And it's something that I, I definitely am going to consider as possibly a next through hike. I've also looked at the long trail in Vermont. Mm -hmm. I like those kind of like uh, shorter trails, at least for now you know, as far as time-wise goes, because you can pound a mountain less than a month. So something like that. But I definitely, during my superior hiking trail through hike, caught the uh, through hike bug. Yeah. The long trail is, I haven't hiked it, but it's a butt kicker. I actually have hiked the first half of it because it's contiguous with the AT, but a lot of people just think that, you know, pound for pound, mile for mile, it's actually harder than even the, the AT. It, New Hampshire, Maine and the AT are totally different world, much harder. But um, the CT, seriously, especially if you go southbound, go start in Denver, I just think it's the perfect hike. And, and, and I tell people that the ratio of effort to reward, well, let's do it, reward to effort, is much higher on the CT than it is on the AT. It's just gorgeous. The views in the landscapes changing, it's just fantastic. And um, it's very doable. It's, it's graded gently. I mean, there's a few steep climbs, but nothing insane. And gosh, it's just a spectacular trail. Really, really well done. There is a shelter there. When I walked past it, I was like, what is that thing? One shelter way down south. So I, I can highly, highly recommend that one. And like I say, it can be done in three, four weeks, no problem. Yeah, it sounds great. I mean, the Superior Hiking Trail is about 300 miles and I did that one in 21 days and that there's a lot of up and down. I mean, probably nothing like, definitely nothing like the AT. I mean, the highest point on the Superior Hiking Trail is like just over 2,000 feet. So it, it's just a lot of up and down through river gorges up to the, the tops of these ridges. And um, we did experience the long trail this past summer, Sarah and I did a couple days on the long trail when we did a road trip out to Maine. So we stayed, um, let's see, where did we hike? It was near Stowe, Vermont. Okay. Um, so we got a lot of um, different peaks that we summited. Right, yeah, and that's north of where the AT turns west. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep, yep. So that, that was very challenging and I'm, I'm thinking that someday I would like that. Um, obviously in Minnesota here, we don't have the mountains, mm -hmm. but something along those lines of a challenging hike that that you get either out west or on along the AT would be mm -hmm. something I'd like to do. If you do decide to do a section of the AT, give me a holler. I I have I have very, you know, depending on how long you want to go, I have I have recommendations for that. Not that I know everything, but there are just particular sections where, again, the the ratio of reward to effort is higher than it is in some places. You've probably heard of the the uh, the legendary green tunnel on the AT. There's some truth to that. You spend a lot of time in the trees, you know. But to me, that just means the rewards that you do get are, you know, they it's like they're even better when you get a view or it's even better when you come to a cool waterfall or whatever. Yeah, we were um, on a section of the AT two years ago in December, December of 2018, where it begins down in Georgia. And it was all just trees. I wasn't impressed at all by that section. Well, we were also there yeah. in December too. So there was no, no canopy. <laughs> yeah. It's so weird in the winter. Cause I've done some winter hiking, gone back and hiked about 300, 400 more miles of the AT just in sections, just because I like to get out there and some of it in the winter. It's like witchy and strange, you know, and these just, just these bare trees and this huge layer of leaves and there's not even birds or a squirrel. It really feels like a, like a creepy movie out there. I mean, it's kind of, it has its own kind of beauty, but it is very weird. 
And, you know, even with the canopy, you get a lot of trees and you get a lot of straight up and straight down. I say the dang AT looks for every single hill it can find and goes straight up and straight down. Now, ATC has, you know, improved that. So, but when, you know, when it was built, there was no sensibility about switchbacks and stuff. They're like, hey, CCC guys, we want the trail to go there. And they just shoot it straight up this insane ridge and you're up there like huffing and puffing. And then you go down something equally steep or worse. And it's like, my knees aren't gonna make this, but it is an adventure. It's so, mm, it's great. Ah, I do wanna say this. If you're a through hiker, if you're a hiker hiker, if you're an open space user, please consider volunteering your time, even if just one day a year, because you know, most of the people who do trail maintenance and stuff are really old, I've learned, because I've gone out for four weeks on ATC trail crews. And um, we got to get back and we need, we need all kinds of people who are willing to go out and do that. No, that's so true though. Like there's so many young people using the trail, but, and that's something we've talked about too. Like we want to get out there and go on a trail crew and give back to the trails that like the SHT in here in Minnesota, we want to make that a priority as soon as possible. Like this summer, we would love to go do that. Yeah. And there's a whole big, um, with the North country trail too, um, a whole, reroute um through the arrowhead of minnesota right and um yeah there's a lot of work to be done there too so that's one thing that i was hoping to do this spring actually but with the whole virus thing that all got right. put on hold well apparently at this point i mean i don't know if they'll go through it but i just got mailing from the colorado trail foundation they have crews that go out to do particular projects you know i don't know 15 20 a year and you pay a little fee because it's a nonprofit, which is fine. Now with the ATC, you don't have to pay. Um, and you go to their, boot, their base camps and stuff. But so, you know, that's also something you could always think about, you know, if you just want a kind of a taste of what it's like. So anyway, I just really encourage people to try to get back if they can. Definitely. And that's an experience in itself. And it's got to be super yep. rewarding to just get out there. And I know we talked with Matt, who works for the NCT, and he talked about trail crews and volunteering and how rewarding it was, even with his family. On the ATC trail crews that I've done, it's really true. It's sort of like a little crystallized version of what it feels like to be on a through hike, because it's really the same thing. You're throwing together all these different people who don't know each other in the woods. You're camping. You're working really hard every day towards some goal. I mean, literally in a team lifting 600 pound rocks and stuff. And, um, and the camaraderie develops really fast. It's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's a fun experience too. Yeah, definitely. So where can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about you, reach out to you, get information? Yeah, you know, I guess the best thing to do, um, since I have a very conflicted relationship with social media, People can find me, Clay Bonnyman Evans, that middle name is critical, B-O-N-N-Y-M-A-N. -N -N. But I barely go on there. I have a website, claybonnymanevans.com, which has most of my hiking writing and other stuff. You know, if you're interested in some of the other stuff, there are links to other websites that I have that, that deal with those things, you know, other parts of my life. Yeah, all the writing you've done. Mm, yeah, and I've been super lucky to be part of some experiences that basically nobody gets to be a part of. So I, I, I'm just really fortunate. If I, you know, if I fall over dead tomorrow of coronavirus, I have zero complaints. I've had a really cool life. So I'd like to, I'd like to do some more hiking, but if it's not in the cards, I will not complain. <laughs> Is getting to Minnesota to do like the SHT a dream at all or in the books? I'll tell you what, here's, here's the thing. If I were to go back to Minnesota, I would need to go back to the Boundary Waters. I just, and I think you can hike around there, can't you? Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, seem, yeah, I, it seems like it might be tough just the way the lakes are, but I was so smitten by that place. I just was blown away. I love that experience. Um, and it's such a gorgeous part of the world that Colorado people, they mostly don't even think about stuff like that. So, but Superior Hiking Trail, why not? I have a, I have a friend who was on the AT same year as I was, and he actually lives here younger, much younger than me. He's actually in the process of trying to become the first person to through hike all of the National Scenic Trails. 
So he needs to do North Country, um, which of course is the biggie, but he's getting there. He's working on it. So I love, I love that. And Ice Age seems interesting to me. All of that country up there. Yeah, the Boundary Waters is pretty magical. We're getting ready to go up there in a couple of weeks here when it's open again for yeah, they overnight. Just, <laughs> they just reopened it. So starting um, May 18th, you can start camping in there again. The thing I loved about going in August, again, I wasn't tormented by mosquitoes, which was supposedly the problem, but the water was just so much fun to swim in. You know, we this friend of mine and I, you know, we just take the canoe out and just jump out and dive deep and you know it's whatever it's that brown but it's clear brown it's just gorgeous gosh I just have huge romantic memories of going up to Boundary Waters I need to go back yeah it's a pretty neat place the sunsets there are amazing and just the mm. uh, mm. spray of stars that you see at night jeez yeah incredible I didn't hear wolves I was hoping to hear wolves but I didn't maybe someday yeah, they're around there. You got to go up to Voyagers National Park for that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, well, this has been super cool to talk to you, get your perspective. I do appreciate your having me on. Thank you so much for reaching out to us. We love sharing these stories with you through the Hiking Through Life podcast, and we're so grateful that you listen to this podcast. If you'd like to support the Hiking Through Life podcast further, we have these amazing new t-shirts and water bottles. The t-shirts come in four colors, and the water bottles are perfect for trails, adventuring, or daily use. Consider checking them out at hikingthroughlife.net slash shop. Use the code podcast and receive 10% off your first order. You've been listening to the Hiking Through Life podcast. Peace, love, and hike through life.